So I just want to welcome everyone to this ancestral healing call. And um, I'm really excited to have these calls with the community wide, though we may be geographically. Um, because I think that ancestral healing is a topic that is coming up more and more in our world right now. And I think that a lot of people don't know quite what to think about it, or they have strong intuitions about it that they don't necessarily have others to engage in that conversation with. So it is my hope and prayer that this call that we share today and the calls that we share almost every single month um, become a resource for people to enter into a conversation about ancestors and what does it mean to do ancestral healing and what is an ancestral unwellness and all things connected to this. Um, so it is a pleasure to be here with all of you on this beautiful summer evening. And, um, and so I just wanted to take a moment and I'm going to unmute everyone and I just want us to take a moment and just name the places where our people are from. And this can literally be where you live now, where your family raised you, or all of the places your family may have raised you. Um, or it can be further back, like where your grandparents or great grandparents were from, or even like hundreds of years ago, if you have the resources and have learned that, those things. Um, so I'm gonna unmute everyone and hopefully it won't be everybody speaking at the same time, but even so, we're just gonna name the places so that um, all of those places are honored. So I think everyone is unmuted now. So my ancestors are from um, Western North Carolina, East Tennessee, Southern West Virginia, um, part of Kentucky also, I believe, um, all through that region of Appalachia. And earlier than that, I have ancestors who are both Cherokee and Pamunkey, native to this land, as well as um, from France and England and Wales and Scotland. Who'd like to go next? I will. So um, my ancestors, first generation are from New York. <laughs> they go back to Italy, England, Egypt, Germany, uh, and Ireland. Wonderful. Kim. My name is Derek. Or Derek. And, <laughs> yep, my name is Derek, and uh, I'm really deep diving into it. Uh, got some natives, got some Egypt, got some uh, Noah times. Just very fascinating, great to uh, feel the Native American spirit that we're sharing. I'm coming in from Ohio. Thank you. I'll go next. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Latina and my uh, background is Peruvian and also from Argentina. And before that, um, Russia, Russian German, and also um, uh, Italian. So did your ancestors immigrate to Peru and Argentina? Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Some of them did. So some of them. <laughs> awesome. Some were already there. Right. <laughs> like Peruvian side. So. Thank you. Yeah. I'll go. This is Kim. Um, I uh, currently live in Maryland. I grew up in Virginia. Um, my um, parents grew up in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, but my cultural, I guess, or where we're from European would be Germany and um, Ireland. I feel a super strong connection, though, somewhere along the line with the Native American. Um, so I'm just, I'm not really sure how that ties in, but it's in my soul. I can feel that. So, <laughs> Thank you. Hmm. I guess I'll go next. Um, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it's Amy, and I'm not sure exactly where I'm from. I'm Jewish, so kind of just been wandering around a lot ever since we crossed the Red Sea. <laughs> um, I was born in Philadelphia. My parents were born in Philadelphia. My grandparents came over. Um, uh, some of them that we know came from uh, the Black across the Black Sea on some boats, um, immigrated through Ellis Island, and. Um, I believe around the area that is currently the Ukraine, uh, changed names a lot over the time since it changed hands. So Eastern European Jewish is what I do know. And I think pretty much 100% actually from my understanding. So, uh, but not missing kind of like a a land of our own since, you know, we've been so nomadic. So that's an interesting lineage to come from. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'll go. My name is Wendy, um, and I am in Maryland currently. Um, My family came from um, Poland, Germany area um, as well. That's all I know. Thank you. So I think it's a, a pretty common thing in this culture, this North American culture, to maybe not know so much about our roots and to have what Amy was talking about, like a sense of that groundlessness and longing to connect with something that is deeper. And I heard Kim, you speaking to it, like this soul connection to the native people of this land. And I think that because so many of us are, our people are from so many different places in the world and we somehow all come to be here at this time, Um, so many traditions have been lost, languages have been lost, uh, spiritual ways and traditions and rituals have been lost, Uh, our cultures have been lost, and, and yet we still have the longing for those things, and so I find that a lot of people who are called to ancestral healing want not only to bring healing to their families and their lineages, but also long for this bigger sense of healing that comes through knowing who I am, where I'm from, what is the land of my people, what are the traditions, what is the food of my ancestors, what are the languages they spoke. And for for those of us that have a a more direct connection with that, um, I think that that's a real gift in this world. And we have so much to learn from, from people who have Uh, that kind of direct connection. I know it's something that I've longed for in my own life. Um, And so one of the things that I was hoping to bring to this conversation tonight is this whole, um, this, this, the longings that we have to connect with our people um, through bringing healing, but then also to, to kind of spend a little bit of time understanding what is it that's being healed? Like, what is the unwellness? And for a lot of us, that uh, nomadic way, that, that loss of roots and loss of connection is part of what's being healed. But sometimes it's also a lot more personal than that. And the work can be powerful in both ways. So before we go too deep into the conversation and, uh, and invite questions as well, I just want to open our space with a prayer. Now that we're all here a little bit more, um, this will help to invoke all the benevolent spirits that come with us every single day of our lives and offer their support. So if you want to close your eyes and just let yourself find the most comfortable way of sitting where you are, feeling your body resting in your seat. And feeling the breath moving through. And just taking these next few moments to see what it feels like to be you today. And I'll open us with a prayer.
Gratitude for this opportunity to gather in this beautiful summer evening to enter into this dialogue of what is it to be in relationship with ancestors? What is it to pray for healing of our people and to find a deeper connection with our sense of who we truly are? And I hope that our time together will be meaningful for all who have come. I call the elders, the masters, the teachers, the wise ones, the guides, the guardians, and our radiant well grandmothers and grandfathers, our ancestors. Please be with us in this space. Help to guide our conversation in a way that is most nourishing at this time. And help us as we navigate our days to be in connection with you, to listen a little bit more deeply, and to follow the call of the soul. And for this, we thank you. So I wanted to begin tonight uh, by sharing a book that has been really meaningful in my journey of ancestral connection and, um, and connecting with something more than a contemporary Western point of view um, that is trying to find ways to, to do these things that have been ancestrally rooted for thousands and thousands of years before we forgot. And the book that has been super meaningful in my journey is The Smell of Rain on Dust by Martine Prechtel. And this book looks at grief and ritual and the connections between the living and those who have transitioned out of this world in a way that is super beautiful and poetic. And um, his work in general is amazing. If you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend checking out any of his books uh, or the information you can find online. Um, so the section that I wanted to read from tonight um, talks a little bit about what can cause ancestral unwellness. Certainly not the full spectrum of that, but uh, has, he has a, a good overview of, of some of the things that can contribute to ancestral unwellness. So I'm going to skip around a little bit, but try to give you a full sense of, of his idea here. The old understanding is that when a person dies, that person's spirit needs to begin traveling away from the shores of this beautiful flowering earth across the ocean of time without ever looking back to arrive on the concentric shores surrounding and facing this reality we live in called the beach of stars where ideally this being is met by their last happy ancestors. These old ancestral spirits pull the newly dead spirit into a period of ritual initiation inside the other world. In order for the dead person's traveling soul to reach the opposite shore to be initiated and transformed into a life-giving force from a human spirit, all their living relatives have to show how deeply they feel the loss of the deceased in a real and honest show of grief in the form of what in some parts of the world is often called awake. It is by the presence of their feeling of missing her or him expressed in a collective way that creates paddles of tears with canoes made out of old songs that majestically and assuredly chauffeurs the dead person's disembodied life force right into the arms of the ancestral pool of souls. The dead person's soul is kept viable and literally lives, albeit in another dimension, off of the life force expressed by the living during the canoe of tears. If enough relatives, friends, and life companions give it their all, the soul of the one whose loss they so deeply feel is not only carried to safety to the shores of the beach of stars, but like a baby chick has enough of a spiritual yolk sack supplied by the spiritual worth of the beauty of the grief and praise expressed 
to maintain them during the first stages of transformation into a useful ancestral force and away from the more shallow fading memory as a person. Um, and so what, one of the things that I love about this, uh, the way that he shares this, is it really, um, it, it really highlights the necessary relationship between the person who has died and the living. And it seems to me that so much of the time in our funerals and memorial services that we have in this Western culture, the person who has died is kind of absent from the experience. And it's more oriented toward supporting the people who are grieving. But even in that, we don't always give ourselves permission to really feel the loss. We wanna you know, try to not cry too much and, and hold ourselves together and be strong and all of these things that are um, kind of a part of what I see as the stoic, uh, the stoic history of our ancestors in this culture. Um, but it doesn't necessarily connect us in, in the heart with the bigger trajectory of losing someone who's then moving along to whatever comes next. And so he goes on to share in this uh, part of this book that when the dead are not grieved properly, regardless of whatever happened in their life, they're not able to make it to the other side. And they sometimes get stuck in the process and become what we now call ghosts. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting that in so much of American culture, especially North American culture, there's this obsession with ghosts and updates and horror movies and the undead and all of these kind of things, especially around Halloween time, we see these things in droves. But there's not necessarily such a rich and meaningful connection to being with the dead and the whole picture around living and dying. And so, uh, so Martin Prechtel goes on to say that those who aren't mourned properly never make it. And so they come back and they live as, as they don't become ancestors. They live as unwell and that can influence the living in ways that can be very detrimental. And in this bigger picture of the work of ancestral healing, one of the things that we're looking at is what are the issues that are showing up in the lives of the living? What are the issues that each of us carry? What are the issues that are coming up in our families? Like, are there conflicts that seem unresolvable? Are there misunderstandings that seem bigger than the people who are showing up there face to face? Sometimes it can be issues like a certain kind of illness keeps showing up in a family, or it can be um, issues of like, something happening to the second born son of each family. I, I've had clients that have had all of these kind of things that show up. And the work of ancestral healing is trying to get back beyond the stuckness and the unwellness and the, the, the ghosts, the ancestors that never made it there. Um, and it is possible through ritual work and through connecting with well ancestors back before the, those unwellnesses crept in it's possible to resolve those things and to bring healing to those things through ritual offerings, through prayer, through connection, and through uh, being in relationship with well ancestors. Um, and for some people who begin this work, um, they're called to it because they feel the issues that are hanging out in themselves and in their families and they don't know what to do. But the idea of being in contact with a spirit or an ancestor or some kind of guide that is non-corporeal and not of this world is a little, is a little weird. And uh, there can be a lot of skepticism around that. Um, but fortunately, there are lots of different ways to approach that and to help us to cultivate relationship that is not based in imagining, but that is based in um, really direct experience. Um, so I think I will pause there for the moment and just see what kind of thoughts and questions um, are stirring. Um, so if you are, if you're in the video box, I can see you. Um, if you're not in the video box, you're welcome to type in your questions uh, to the chat. Um, so the floor is open. I have a question. Go for it, Amy. I'm wondering about people who don't have a lot of 
people like say you didn't have children or like you're a child that dies on a boat crossing to this country like people might not know you died like it sounds a little bit i guess the um the res sort of the resistance i felt was about what about people who die alone what about people who don't choose to have children what about people who are more introverted or hermit like and you know not like the amount of whether we make it to the other side based on how many people who are still on this side grieve doesn't feel like it lands really well for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that the measure of how you lived should is necessarily equated with whether you're aggrieved when you pass or what if like your family members are all dead and you're the last one or it just something in there feels. So I, I, I had, I got, I got a little trip there. Cause like, you know, your soul should be able to be judged on its own, regardless of how many people you leave behind that, that are there to grieve you. I certainly don't profess to be the ultimate expert on any of these things and understand that what I'm sharing comes from the Mayan culture. And that is something that uh, has been tracked and shared from that tradition. And certainly many different traditions have different beliefs around this. But I will also say that one of the things that, um, that I have been tracking in my years of doing this work is that contemporary Western people have a really hard time uh, accepting these kind of ideas. And again, I'm not saying that this is the only one or the right one. It's just a starting point for our conversation tonight. Um, ultimately, we in the West, a lot of times believe that um, our personality or our efforts, our work, our independence, our individuality lead everything. And that is, that is simply one of the cultural beliefs that we have now, but it's certainly not um, the only one. And it's certainly not uh, in alignment with a lot of the older cultures on this planet. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. If it, uh, if it doesn't land with you, you're certainly free to explore something that may land better for you. Um, but I think it's really important to, to just take in that um, the ways of relating that between the living and the dead are things that we have lost culturally in this day and age. And that is itself a symptom of ancestral tradition loss. Um, and losing that connection. So like, I'll just say that um, being Jewish, we have rituals around this mm -hmm. that passed down. And so, um, yeah, like people go to synagogue and pray and do the mourner's Kaddish, like, and they mm -hmm. join and then you light a candle every year on the anniversary of their passing called a yard site, which is a candle of remembrance. And there are definitely, um, I think, traditions that have been passed on in different cultures or religious belief systems that do honor the connection between the dead and the living. I, I think the, the, the comment you made about the funerals being for those who are, who are on this side grieving, kind of leaving out the person, I, I did find that interesting. Um, I do think it's important to feel that the, the person is involved, that past is involved in the funeral. Um, that their energy is there. And I've been to funerals where it hasn't been the case and it felt really strange, mm -hmm. um, it, 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 uncomfortable, you know, knowing that the person who lived and the way the ceremony was conducted were not in alignment. Um, but the idea that that, that grief is or that how far the canoe goes is based on how many people are grieving you or how hard. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the part that I, I just ch challenge in my own um, yeah. value system. But, but sure. grieving, grieving is definitely something that Western culture could do more, I think, to include. Absolutely. Um, you know, we don't really give time for grief in our culture. We just try to, you know, move on. And I feel like grief is one of the deepest, most valuable emotions to experience. I, I would completely. like to add, add something to that, if I could. Can, can you just hold on one second? And I will uh, come right back to you, I promise. All right. Um, I just wanted to address one of the other things that Amy brought up as she was sharing there. Um, uh, what, do you, what happens when someone dies and there's no one to grieve them? What happens when someone dies and no one knows? And these are things that some cultures have ways of dealing with. In fact, I, um, Amy, I would highly encourage you to check out this book because it goes much more in depth than I possibly can here in looking at that. And um, 
and just really considering that when someone dies, at least according to, to this point of view, which I'm sharing, uh, when someone dies and there's no one to grieve them, um, or when someone dies and nobody likes them, and it's, it, it can lead to that person becoming an unwell ancestor. And some of the work is absolutely best when it's blood lineage, but some of the work can also be done by others. So I'm the last of my line. I don't have children, I won't have children. Um, there's no one else to, to give birth to, to our lineage, and so I will be the last of the line. And I am hoping that when my time comes, there will be someone there who can do the proper ritual to be able to honor my spirit onward. And I would pray that's true for everyone. And unfortunately in our culture, it's not. And unfortunately in our culture, there's a lot of ancestral unwellness that hasn't been tended in decades or centuries or millennia. And that's what we're looking at today in a world that is really, really screwed up. Um, so Amy, thank you for bringing these things to the conversation. Derek, please. Yes, yeah, so from someone who has experienced some of this healing, so when the soul passes on, the aspect of that person could, could remain. So why is that important? If the soul continues to have aspects that's left behind, when that soul reincarnates again, it has that baggage, if you will, that lineage scar from those other remaining pieces, and that individual is living their life and has no clue about it. So why I take this healing uh, very seriously is because if you can heal those aspects that have been scarred, even if that person doesn't understand it and release that tension, it really frees up the emotion and the energy of that individual in the current flesh. So, but the, yes, the, the soul moves on to the next thing, but that aspect could remain. And, and I think that's the difference between my soul going on and my aspect remaining. Just one day. I think that's a that's a great thing to contribute, Derek. And one of the one of the interesting things that I read a little bit about that I want to find more about, but it's hard to in the English language right now. Um, there are some cultures that believe that there are multiple iterations of a being. So, like what you're bringing attention to, as I've heard it shared, I think from from Mongolian traditions. Um, the, there's a part of the soul that reincarnates and becomes a completely separate person that has nothing to do with lineage or ancestry or, or the life they left behind. And that part of the soul, you know, goes on its path. It, the healing is always good because like there's a soup of consciousness from which we all emerge. And when there's unwellness, like that keeps getting cycled over and over and over again, it's like, it's like when we make our water dirty and we just keep cycling it over and over and over again, it doesn't get better. Things get worse. Um, but then again, the part of us that is an ancestor that, that does remain an ancestor and is an imprint and a lineage that is not only in the past, but is accessible now. Like my father died in 2016 and I have an ongoing relationship with him through the ancestral work that I am a part of. And I have watched him uh, in my journey space. I've watched him change. I've watched him get younger. I've watched him get taller. I've watched him get stronger. I've watched him completely change the way that he is now. So it is even possible that, that someone who has died, like the imprint that they leave behind, as you put it, like is not just an imprint. It, they still continue in that form as well. And I'm sure that if we were to go into into lots of cultures, they all have different ideas about it. And that's something that is so beautiful um, and definitely worthy of honoring. There are so many different ways that this could be seen. Thank you for sharing. So can I ask a question that doesn't have to do with those thoughts, which were yeah. very interesting. Um, so I do, uh, with my prayers, I talk to the ancestors and I ask them to heal the ancestral wounds down the line. When I do, I speak to the ancestors that I knew who are maybe unwell. Are they, do they have the ability to work with me too, to heal the ancestral wounds down the line? Because I go back further, but I also talk to the ones that I know. They're stuck. So, you think they still have this ability? I think that's a, that's a great question. And while it is possible that recent ancestors um, can be well, 
the thing that that they may not have is connection to the original wellness of the lineage so over over millennia the history of, of humanity almost every culture had some kind of ancestral practices that they would do in order to at the time of death and afterwards to help bring that person fully into the line of ancestors and so as the you know religions came in and found these traditions to be uh, damaging or I don't know like there's so much judgment and criticism around these um, original kind of traditions um, those a lot of those traditions were removed uh, or were banned or forbidden and so as the dead lost uh, as we lost the tending of the dead um, like people didn't become ancestors all the time some of them may some of them may not depending on so many things so while it's possible to connect with a, a recent ancestor who you feel in your heart and soul as well if you want to bring the fullest clearing to the lineage it helps to go way back to a place where the ancestors were all well and strong and well connected to each other and the original energetic wellness of the line that is still bright and available now and so the way that i do this work is by connecting with that old guide on each of the lines and then working to bring that wellness through the lineage and then healing all of the things that have happened down the line that you know cause the lineage from being able to be well and in turn keep us from being able to live in our fullest wellness because we're still carrying the heavy burdens of the people before us um so through doing that kind of work it's also possible to to have the protection of an old well guide who can make sure that uh, we are not picking up and carrying the heaviness that is not ours to carry. It is not our responsibility as the living to heal the ancestors. In fact, we can't do it. We can only pray for it to happen and connect with the right kind of guides to be able to bring that into being. The ancestors have to heal the ancestors ultimately. Right. Um, and so I, I always try to tell people uh, how important it is to, to make sure that you're working with guides who can add that protection and who can help uh, to bring the wellness all the way through the line. And then with that protection, it's easy, at least easier to be able to see into the lineage and ask questions like, what are the personal traumas and uh, struggles that have happened here? And what are the like intergenerational struggles and traumas that have happened and what are the issues that come up sometimes intergenerationally over many generations and what of those are connected to the things that were happening culturally at the time how did that change over time and how did that get passed down the line like a, a spiritual virus almost yeah. um, that is still affecting us now and so in um, my mother's mother's line I was able to go back very, very far and to connect with a very strong, powerful guide who was connected to like the energy of lightning and thunderstorms and earthquakes, this very powerful feminine force. And she was able to show me how the original wound on that line was the loss of faith in our own intuitive gifts that are our birthright. And over time, that was handed down mother to daughter in a way that created daughters not to trust themselves, but because the message of don't trust yourself came from the mother, don't trust your mother. And it's passed down generation after generation and the gifts were suppressed and turned off and hidden and forbidden and denied. And that eventually became deep emotional unwellness and mental illness. And so what a beautiful thing it is to be able to track that whole kind of centuries long process to be able to understand how it came to be the people that I know, like the struggles that they've had and what immense compassion is possible to, when you see it in that way. But the personal and the cultural, the small picture and the big picture are so interwoven. Um, it's impossible to, to take them apart because we live, we're the product of our times. We live in the, in the culture that we're born into and we're conditioned within that culture. So what a powerful thing it is to be able to, to connect back before that in order to understand the, the fuller context and to be able to then clear it. Um, so when my father died, I went to an ancestralization ritual with Maladoma Somme in North Carolina. And I ancestralized my father and I ancestralized my great grandmother. 
And so they were two bright points of wellness on the line, which was wonderful and amazing. And I could feel that shift in me and the ability to connect with them in a totally different way. And over time, I started to understand that those are bright spots in a line that wasn't bright. And there were things that had to be dealt with in another way. So I would encourage you to explore that um, for yourself in whatever way feels right. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with connecting with recent ancestors if you feel clear that they're well and um, are not going to affect you in some kind of detrimental way. Um, and just know that it's possible to go back a lot further and um, clear everything else out too. Thank you. Sometimes I do go back further, but not that much, not that often. So now I'm going to have to look with, look at this with different eyes, you know, of discernment. So I appreciate that. Of course. I think it's interesting too, to make ancestral connections with, with people who are not ones that we've known. So we don't come with any preconceived ideas about them and who they are. We don't project any personality onto them. We can literally meet them like strangers and ask them, who are you? Where are you from? What's your deal? What are your gifts? What are your uh, ways of working? And how does that show up in me? We're, we're the two extreme ends of the line. Um, it can be fascinating to explore. Thank you. Of course. So I want to make space uh, if there's one more question before we do a meditation together. Or if there are no more questions. Okay, Kim, go ahead. Sort of kind of putting things together here for a minute. Um, thank you. Uh, so when you, you said that the ancestors um, have to do the healing themselves, mm -hmm. but it's almost like the living have kind of created this unhealed or unwellness in the ancestors. Why, like, in um, when line of thinking around the like the, the the not properly grieving but then like we're actually kind of affecting that as well by doing the ancestral healing the ritualization or like the ceremony around it so it's, it's kind of like a combo deal <laughs> um what is my question here so how is it that the ancestors are kind of in charge of that or like that, that they're, how do, how do they do the healing? It's like facilitated by us or sparked by uh, the living? Spark, sparked is a wonderful word. And I, I also just want to say that um, the living, we aren't the cause of the ancestral unwellness. We've just forgotten how to tend a lot of that by and large in this modern culture. Um, so it's not the the unwellness isn't our fault or even our responsibility in such a, a specific way, but it is ours to um, to call for the healing and the connection so that it can happen. And every ancestral guide, every ancestral lineage does that healing in a different way. And in fact, when I work with people and they start to connect with a guide who then brings healing to uh, the lineage of ancestors it comes in such amazing ways. Like one of my ancestors um, appeared to me as an, uh, an artisan and an alchemist. And he made these clear glass spheres. And then he painted tiny red birds on them. And that's whenever I would go into journey space with him, that's what he'd be doing. And he'd be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he would finish his little tiny mic microscopic almost paintings in these tiny little globes and then he would hang them up to dry. And so he put all of the ancestors in the entire lineage between him and me into one of these little globes. And then he could look in on them and see what they were doing and how they were doing. And he was the one sending them the healing. And again, like every, every lineage works differently. But for me, it was amazing to, to be able to see that. 
And eventually, it, I think it was around the holidays, and I was in like a little fair trade shop, and I found a little felt red bird in a nest, like a like a Christmas tree ornament. And I was like, oh my God, I have to buy that. Not for the tree, I don't care about that, but as an offering to, to the ancestral line in support of that healing, like it's an acknowledgement and a participation oh. in that. And uh, each different line that I've worked with and each different line that I've supported other people in working with has a different way of doing that. Um, so it is a, we do spark that healing. A lot of times people will say to me when they connect with a guy, like that my ancestral guide just said they've been waiting for me for a really long time, like that they're really glad I'm here. And I think that's pretty common because the ones who are well can see the unwellness, but it takes two. It does take us too to say, hey, like we're ready to show up again. We're ready to do something to feed this. <clears throat> And so as I was sharing with you, like I, I bought this little red felt bird um, in order to, I put it on my altar in order to honor that line. And so that every time I see that red bird, I think of that lineage and I want to honor it and I want to pray for it. And now it, that it's been well for several years, every time I see that red bird, I think of connecting with that part of my lineage, that part of my lineage that wants to do creative things that also happens to like living kind of outside of the busyness of the world in the forest in the trees mm -hmm. um and so i see a part of myself in that but i also see where i came from in a way that that feels really meaningful and i think a lot of times one of the things that we as the living can do to help um, with the process not only for blood ancestors, but for anyone that we care about who has died and who we want to have peace and wellness and uh, a blessed onward journey. So like we can do little things to make offerings too. Um, and so that can, that can literally just be something that we make up, you know, like a little ritual process that can be really beautiful. Um, so my mother died recently and we had a memorial service for her. Um, and we had the, the little pamphlets like most funerals have, but I asked everyone to take it home and put it someplace where they might see it again, maybe even for a few weeks. And every time they see it, just to send out a prayer for her onward journey of wellness. She didn't have a lot of people in her life at the end. And uh, because there was no big memorial service with all of her people from her life who could mourn her together. This was something that was concerning to me, knowing that sometimes if people aren't mourned well, they don't, they don't find their way forward. But it doesn't have to just be the, the blood lineage um, ancestors that we work with, or it doesn't just have to be our blood family that we work with. We can all be engaged in this kind of healing work by and large. Like one of my professors from college who I had immense respect for, he died a couple of years ago. And doing this work, it was a question for me, like, well, what can I do on his behalf because I'm not his family? But I made offerings and I made prayers. I even was lucky enough to get to go to his grave and put flowers there. And I didn't just put the bouquet down. I decorated it like with flowers mm -hmm. everywhere and, and I made it so beautiful. So there's lots of ways that we can do that. Even, even for people who are difficult, who we like lose and we're like, thank, thank goodness they're gone. That happens sometimes, right? That's reality. Like it's still possible to say, thank goodness you're gone. And I wish you nothing but peace in your onward journey. And I am gonna pray for that for you because I want that for everyone. Sometimes that's hard, but I think it's still possible. Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing that beautiful story about the red birds. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you, Kim. So um, I just want to use the last little bit of time that we have here together, together um, to just uh, do a meditation um, that will send some energy onward to someone who, uh, who you're called to send it to right now. So maybe there's somebody that you know, whether it's somebody in your family or somebody in your community, um, or just somebody that you heard about who touched you, who's died in the last bit of time, however feels recent to you. Um, just see if there's someone who comes up uh, to mind. Um, or perhaps if no one comes to mind, um, but you know someone who is nearing the time of transition and someone who's in hospice perhaps, or who clearly has a very short amount of time left 
you can also use this meditation to honor them. Um, so if you would join me in closing your eyes. And again, feel your body where it's resting in your seat. And feel the breath moving in and out. And feel your heart beating. And find that place within your space, within your body, that feels like center. And from that place of center, imagine a root growing down into the earth. And feel it going deep, deep, becoming an anchor for you, connecting you to Mother Earth. And also now, Envisioning a protective sphere all around you, encircling you, and extending out around three feet in every direction. And if you like, you can give this protective sphere a color whatever color might feel good for you. This sphere offers you an extra layer of protection And so now I invite you to call to mind this person who has died recently or who is perhaps getting ready to transition. If you like, you can imagine their face or the sound of their voice. It's good to be able to sense their presence, but to also feel it outside of your protective bubble. And I invite you to call into your heart a prayer for their onward journey, for their letting go of this life, and for their healing. And really let that prayer come into your heart in a way that feels most sincere and true.
And in the moment that feels right for you, when your heart feels full, start to send this prayer to that person, wherever they are. May their pain be washed away. May they find peace. May they be well held as they leave behind this life and begin the next part of the journey. May they be surrounded by love, by the people they loved who have gone on before them, by their ancestors. May they be blessed in all ways. And in these last moments of the meditation, ask inside of yourself if there's some small offering or gesture or little ritual that you could do in order to support this person's onward journey. It could be as simple as lighting a candle or just speaking their name. Or perhaps something more that comes to you. And now letting your attention return to yourself, to your body and your own energy.
And once more, bringing your attention to the breath. And beginning to let go of the protective sphere around you. Knowing that it's always available to you when you need it. And also pulling back the root into your center. And bringing yourself back into the space we've been sharing. And so I just want to take this moment to offer my gratitude to each of you for being with us for contributing your ideas and your understanding, your thoughts and your questions. And most of all, for contributing your care for the ancestors of your own people and the ancestors of, of all at this time, as we're coming back into remembering that we have the responsibility to attend the sacred in our world. And as we continue to do that, it will continue slowly but surely to bring healing to our world. And I hope that, that the conversation tonight has been uh, enlightening and interesting to you and maybe has stirred some of your own thoughts and ideas. And know that I'm always available by email if you wanna keep the conversation going. Um, and I'll be sending out an email to everyone after the call this evening. Um, with, with some further resources, including this book that I shared tonight. Um, so make sure to check in on that. And so I hope you will tend your ancestors in whatever way is in your heart and keep exploring whatever feels like the right way forward for you at this time. And know that I'm here if you ever need some support. And so I am gonna stop the recording in just a moment.